Hi everyone, and with a gap between series retrospectives, it's time for another round of one-off productions on this channel. St to start with this batch, we will look at, well, some obscure anime. And this time we're in for a real treat, because this time we will be looking at Megazone 23. Now Megazone 23 is the first OVA original video animation we will look at here on this channel, and it's a great example of one. Part 1 was produced in 1985 and directed by Noburo Ishiguro, who also worked on Orgus, Space Battleship Yamato 2, and a few other things. While Part 2 was directed in 1986 by the legendary Ichiro Itano, who was known for basically inventing the dynamic action choreography known as the Itano Circus, which revolutionized the anime mech slash spaceship combat into the fluid masterwork it is today. Megazone 23 tells of Shogo Yahagi and his discovery of the true nature of his world, and how he resolves to make it a better place after learning these things. Now of course, we will go more into the plot a bit later, however, there are a few things I'd like to discuss first. Now first off, what is an OVA? Now an OVA is an original video animation, something that was animated and instead of being aired on television, went straight to VHS or other mediums of home media. Now this has numerous advantages and disadvantages to it, and OVAs have a reputation of extremes, if you will. Some are regarded as the best obscure gems and mastercrafts of their day, productions which truly ascend to the highest standards of quality, while others are known for being unfinished and rushed messes that somehow made it off the cutting room floor, though you can honestly be forgiven if you didn't know that or doubted that. This disparity in quality boils down to several factors, although it can mostly be attributed to the varying levels of support various productions got from various studios. Since an OVA was a very studio-based project, if a certain studio didn't feel like giving the amount of attention an OVA would deserve, well, you could definitely tell. Fluctuating fan interest also plays a role in this, although we'll get more into that later. Now, many OVAs that did well are well-remembered, at least by OVA standards, and some of them even went on to spawn full-blown television series. The most famous example is probably the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure OVA, which was produced in 1993 and later went on to spawn the animated series we all know and love today. On the other side of the spectrum, there were many OVAs which lacked the support they needed and the fan reception that studios wished for and were therefore kind of cut halfway through. There are a good deal of many OVA series which were never completed due to poor sales. In between these two extremes, of course, are many OVAs that were finished and were generally competent, but are now only known in passing as footage that City Pop playlists draw footage from. Nothing against City Pop, I do love City Pop. Anyways, all of this tends to go back to the various advantages and disadvantages of the format. Advantages include a great deal of creative control, as directors and writers are not constrained by television time slots, censorship standards, or anything else really. This means that OVAs tend to get right to the point, for better and worse, more on that later, and they don't have any filler. It means that a truly creative process can take hold and proceed to surpass the studio's arbitrary standards, or at least the standards which would be connected to a television production. On the downside, all of this freedom means that OVAs, especially those which do not draw from some other kind of source material, can sometimes come off as a bit muddled, rushed, or just feel a little weird in the pacing slash character development departments especially if they want to establish as much lore as possible, as soon as possible. This can muddle a production, and we will refer to this as OVA syndrome later on. In addition, due to the nature of OVA sales, and generally higher production costs, OVAs run a risk of running out of money before completion, and this can manifest itself in either rushed and underproduced later segments of OVAs, or even outright abandonment. Some were never completed due to this issue. This is especially problematic if multiple installments are planned and the first installments don't sell well enough to support later installments. This also means that the success of the OVA and its popularity is at least somewhat connected to the general state of the Japanese economy. This is why OVAs exploded in the 1980s, generally seen as the Wild West of OVAs, a sort of golden age if you will, where studios were lining up to produce features of all kinds for home consumption and when home consumption was generally healthy enough to support this kind of output. However, with the beginning of a recession on the home islands in the 1990s, OVA production declined as studios no longer had the kind of cash to throw around to support all these experimental home releases, which even if good, might not necessarily sell that well in the recession decade of the 90s. 
Fortunately for all involved though, Megazone 23 did well enough to see the completion of both of its installments. There is also a third one which we might discuss one day. And now that we know what an OVA is, let's discuss this one. Now Megazone 23 is one story split across two movies, and while the two movies are very different in many ways, which we will discuss later, for the plot examination, we will look at the two as a single unit. The plot boils down to carefree Shogo Yahagi, who, after being shown a mysterious new bike by an acquaintance, discovers that the world is not what it seems. The bike turns out to be a secret mech held by government forces who pursue Shogo after he attempts to expose the secret on national TV. The TV feed, is, of course, is cut, although Shogo alludes to government and crashes with his friends and soon-to-be girlfriend Yui in the meantime. Eventually, he agrees to help his friend film an indie film, and, while doing so, a cop tries to pull over from speeding. He eludes the cop, although in doing so ends up hiding in a tunnel and discovers a secret entrance to a secret underground city, which also happens to be home to the military, which is in the process of rearming. It also holds Bahamut, the secret supercomputer which is apparently controlling the world. Here, Shogo meets BD, a major in the military who plans to usurp command in order to put the military in, quote, the hands of those who actually care for those other than themselves. Also, we should note that BD's name is never actually given, so I'm just going to assume it's short for Bad Dude. At this point, we're about 40 minutes into the movie, and things get a little muddled, though thankfully this is an issue limited mostly, if not entirely, to the first movie. While I won't elaborate on this muddling here, as I will in a bit, I just wanted to mention that here. As, back to the plot, BD takes a massive exposition dump on Shogu, explaining everything that doesn't make sense up until this point. He explains that the city they live in is a lie crafted by Bahamut, and Bahamut is a supercomputer controlling this Megazone, the 23rd one, and that a Megazone is actually a spaceship that left Earth about 500 years ago because Earth suffered a devastating war. He, in this case BD, and the military need to usurp Bahamut so that they can fully take back control of society and mobilize it for an upcoming war. This includes gaining control of EVE, a benevolent computer program which manifests itself to the people as a friendly media personality slash pop star, and rearming the nation. He wants to do this because he believes that the Delzag will soon attack and he wants to be at least somewhat prepared for this. While Shogu has a little trouble accepting this at first, after considering all that he's, you know, seen recently, and after acknowledging that him and BD almost accidentally slipped into this space, he decides that it is a possibility BD's telling the truth. BD then offers him a job to help defend from foreign attack, and death should Shogu refuse his offer. As the protagonist, Shogu of course refuses, and Eve next contacts Shogu via his superbike that he stole, uh, revealed to be called the Garland, and says that he needs to go to Bahamut to save her, and in turn save humanity. Now, with all of these revelations, with having learned that his world is a lie, and that those around him are in danger, Shogu goes home and... does almost nothing. The movie kind of goes off the rails for a little bit here. Uh, instead, he just decides to confine himself to a sort of resignation. Uh, this is followed by one of the most awkward, quote, love scenes I've ever seen in any piece of media, and a military coup. What happens is that basically Shogu gets annoyed that he can't really do anything, uh, despite Eve telling him he can, and about living in, on a spaceship. He then proceeds to directly ask Yui for coitus, and exposition dumps as she makes coitus face during said coitus. This of course is spliced between a military coup and the announcement of a war over TV. Um, anyways, humanity now finds itself at war, and society overnight is gripped by a sort of naive jingoism. Although Tomomi does get killed by government agents for happening to make a movie too close to the truth, and having footage of the Garland. This death scars Yui, sees their other roommate Mai go home to her father, a military millionaire who seems as important but is never actually given much screen time, and finally kicks Shogu into gear. Now, he resolves to rescue Eve and resolve everything. He fails though, and BD leaves him for dead somewhere in the Bahumut computer complex. Shogu survives, however and limps out into an empty town, resolving to finish things and save humanity once and for all. Cut to six months later, and the second movie, where Shogu, having been framed for Tomomi's murder, now teams up with an Eve-obsessed gang known as the Trash Gang to take back the Garland and save Eve, and therefore humanity. In the meantime, the war has not been going too well, and although many seek to surrender to the Delzags, who we never actually see, BD resolves to keep the war going in the hope 
that catching Shogu will finally unlock Eve and therefore somehow make the situation better. Yui and Shogu also reconnect at this point and have an exposition dump free coital scene. The literal gang next busts into a government bait operation and successfully steals the Garland back. They then decide that rescuing Eve and launching an all-out assault to do so in the core of Bahumut is probably their best option seeing as that humanity's time is limited on this spaceship. Although they're picked off one by one, the gang and Shogu do succeed in reaching Eve, who eventually explains everything. Basically, Eve is an AI programmed to judge the humans under her stewardship on this spaceship. Those deemed peaceful enough will get past Adam, an AI defense grid on the moon, and thus be allowed to resettle the Earth. Those deemed unworthy won't. They just get toasted. Eve then psychologically analyzes Shogu and says that no matter what happens, he must always have hope, as that is one of the only ways humanity can move forward without war, and that even if she cannot contact Adam at the moment, everything will probably be okay. Shogu then leaves an injured Yui in Eve's care and proceeds to have a beer with the gang as they resign themselves to either Aldum or to Delzag's probably blowing them up. Adam activates Megazone's 23 self-destruct in the process, and BD makes one last appearance here. While BD is, hasn't been mentioned much in this plot summary so far, he is a relatively fleshed out character, and his moral gray zone is something which is quite fascinating. And we see this very strongly here, as although a very military man dedicated to fighting the Delzags, he has no interest in war itself, it seems, but simply pragmatically protecting as much of humanity as he can. We see this here, where instead of attacking Shogu, BD just admits to his mistakes and tells Shogu to be strong. At this point, he knows he's lost and that fighting realistically won't solve anything. As such, he watches as Adam destroys the Delzag ship and leads the remainder of his soldiers off to sacrifice themselves and allow the world to move on without them and their violent stain. As all seems lost, however, Eve activates the final survival protocol and ejects a large portion of the ship containing all of the protagonists and many others past Adam to settle a now vibrant and healed Earth. Here, it seems, they can finally live in peace. Now this is a summary, of course, and do note I cut out a lot of the smaller points that I feel were nice to the story, but not necessarily part of its core. What I really want to talk about is Megazone 23 as an entity, why it is one of the quintessential OVAs. Its two production segments, each with different production decisions and styles, mean that Megazone 23 can check off many of the typical OVA boxes expected, with many good ones and a few bad ones. Its production decisions are really what make it stand out and fascinate me, as it allows it to straddle the OVA experience spectrum. Since these vary by segment, of course, we will start with the weaker of the two, Megazone 23 Part 1. Now, Part 1 is still lovingly crafted, although I should say it does have some unique production decisions and issues. Since both of these are OVAs from the 1980s, I won't really comment on the visuals, though to be honest, with the exception of a few low-frame moments, I really do love the visual of these two productions. They're very gorgeous, and there's just something about the old look that can't be replicated. Just how it resonates a sense of an ethereal past that never quite existed. Anyways, back to looking at Part 1's unique production decisions. Part 1 manifests a lot of the negative OVA traits that we mentioned as being part of OVA Syndrome. Now, again, OVA syndrome is an odd occurrence that we see in some OVAs from time to time, and it is caused by a desire to get a lot of exposition slash story into as dense a package as possible. In turn, OVAs with OVA syndrome often manifest pacing and plot hole issues, a little bit of muddling if you will, because they're in a rush to both establish the lore and setting as quickly as possible. While Part 2 is mostly free of OVA syndrome, Part 1 is stricken by it, and we see many symptoms in it, especially once the plot picks up past the 38th minute mark. I think it's fair to say that even though this kind of breaks the movie for a little bit, it does fix itself in good order. However, it's also fair to say that I think this is something that should be at least mentioned. What causes the break in the movie, so to speak, is the massive exposition dump given by BD, the questions it raises, and how Shogu reacts to all of it. No, this dump takes place about 38 minutes into, if both sections are counted, a 160 minute production, and yet 38 minutes in, BD just lays the entire world bare, and Shogu, who we haven't got really close to yet, reacts in a very questionable manner. Now the movie had hinted at some OVA syndrome symptoms earlier with a few plot holes conveniences like, why is the secret tunnel entrance not guarded? Or 
How convenient is it that Yui happens to be roommates with Shogu's friends, yet never happened to meet or even hear of him before? Uh, but again, the exposition dump and the following awkward scenes are the real manifestations of OVA syndrome in part one and should be noted. Though the movie does fix itself, this is something that I did notice and I think that I should point out for the sake of being fair. First off, the exposition dump creates an expectation of a more faster and frantic pace, as all of these revelations make it seem like something big is about to go down. But the movie's pace doesn't really pick up for another 20-25 minutes, creating an odd disconnect with the pacing, a pacing flaw. This isn't helped by the fact that BD is painted as morally gray and not evil. While Shogo immediately calls him evil, Nothing he says or does in this interaction really paints him as more than morally gray, as a man trying to pragmatically decide the best thing for the people. In fact, this interaction leads to a lot of questions. Is Bahamut malevolent? Is it self-aware? Is Bahamut controlling everyone? If it is controlling everyone, isn't it good that BD wants to break everyone free then? Who made Bahamut? Who's gonna attack? Are they attacking Bahamut or the people? If an attack is really imminent, doesn't that kind of justify BD and the military to some extent? And, you know, there are other questions that you could go off of, of this logic. I'm, I'm just saying that this exposition dumped raised all of these in my head, and the fact that I had to ask so many questions is a telltale sign of OVA syndrome, as it shows that there's a little too much going on all at once. It hasn't necessarily been quite the buildup that we need to reach this kind of exposition. While most of these questions are at some point addressed or answered, the fact that, again, I had to ask them does mean that a little too much was going on here. This sense of confusion is not necessarily helped by Shogu's reaction, which, although resignation does seem a little realistic, doesn't necessarily endure him to either the viewer or help explain anything to the viewer. He's specifically told by Eve he can do something, and yet he doesn't necessarily do anything immediately, so now this helps create the pacing issue that I mentioned earlier, and also proceeds to make him look a little stupid. Not a good look. The movie does go on to basically reassemble itself and put itself back on track, although there are a few more awkward and bizarre production decisions which do hinder this process, and these are mostly linked to music and the awkward coitus scene. Now, starting with the most obvious, music is a very important tool for setting the tone of any scene. So, when a serious and impactful violent coup scene occurs to a funzy background track, and my brain can't help but get a little confused. It's a literal violent coup. They blew up Lupin Cop, for God's sakes. But the music is a comedy score. Why? The same thing occurs when the news announces that a war has begun, a crisis, an existential threat to humanity, and that everyone must mobilize to confront it. This serious scene, with drastic consequences, could have used any sort of action-packed music, or sad music, or tense music, or suspenseful music. All of these could have worked here, but again, the sort of jokey comedy background track is used. Why? These music decisions, and I'm sure there's other examples in part one, uh, but these music examples don't lend themselves to what is being portrayed visually and lead to a sort of tonal confusion. While this is not a direct symptom of OVA syndrome, it is something that you do notice in OVAs from time to time, where it seems that the music wasn't always keyed to the scene quite properly. But these bizarre production decisions pale in comparison to the quote-unquote love scene. Look, I'm not going to fixate on the scene because these kind of scenes are already kind of weird and awkward, but why of all scenes that you could have had, is this the scene that they use for another exposition dump? One which has already been explained, by the way. Shogu's ramblings are basically repeats of what BD told him. They're not romantic. They're not hot. They don't add anything to the scene other than exposition that has already been established. It, it just kind of makes an inherently awkward scene even more awkward and uncomfortable. Did, did they think that the plot was too complicated and certain visuals would help the viewer pay more attention to its intricacies? Uh, what? I, I don't know. It's just really weird that there's a massive exposition dump that's already been done that occurs during a quote, love scene. Very weird, very uncomfortable. I had so many questions during that, most of which involving the words why or what were you thinking. My last grievance is, during the announcement of a massive war, no one really seems to react. Uh, there's a kind of naive, vaguely positive reaction. The news of the war is treated the same way as the opening of a new Walmart. Some people will make a day of it, some people won't. Doesn't really affect you though. Um, 
why is no one reacting? I always thought that part was a little weird too. But with my grievances with part one set aside, I will say that I still quite enjoyed part one. And that I think a lot of its issues can be chalked up to OVA syndrome. And while a few may not be direct symptoms of it, I'm willing to just chalk it up to OVA syndrome anyways, as they don't ruin the movie for me, even if they do perplex me. What doesn't perplex me is part two, a drastic improvement on part one. Where part one felt like a directionless but well-intended story from time to time with a case of OVA syndrome, part two is for the most part a tight production focused on building upon the lore established in part one. It has fewer, if any, plot holes, and everything and everyone just makes a lot more sense. Sure, the Trash Gang's obsession with Eve is a little weird, unexplained, unexplored, but I have no issue with that. Shogo, BD, and Yui are much more fleshed out, and all feel a lot more human in Part 2. Everything just feels more natural and grounded. Part 2 is an amazing film, and can honestly almost stand on its own, although it kind of needs the exposition present in Part 1. I think if you watch Part 2 without Part 1, you would still enjoy it, although it would be kind of confusing because... While the exposition dumps in Part 1 are clunky, it does allow Part 1 to sort of fall on the sort of explaining things so that Part 2 can really shine. I don't really have any issues with Part 2, maybe because of this, as almost everything in it makes for a great short film. It has a good set of relatively fleshed out characters, a concrete plot objective, a good twist or two, some excellent action sequences, and a lot of heart. I'd like to take a second, in fact, to just talk about these action sequences as their stunning animation combined with the amazing OST make for some of the funnest scenes I've seen in a while. You can really tell that the direction of Mr. Itano is really coming through, as his circus style of animated animation is coming through. In his space battles, in his motorcycle chase scenes, there's just so many dynamic frames of action and so many beautiful spreads of smoke and movement and light which really convey the action and passion that is present in every one of these scenes. It makes for a great movie and great fun. Just look at the splendor. Just look at how much they've stuffed into every frame of animation. Consider that they got one of the masters, one of the pioneers of this kind of animation, Ichiro Itano, to direct this and truly pour his heart into many of these beautiful and groundbreaking scenes. It's just splendiferous, and I think part two is amazing. It really is just amazing. The only thing I really don't understand about part two is why it looks different. Well, I, I understand that the action sequences are different, seeing as that Itano is a much more action-focused director, and of course he's going to put a spin on things and make it just so much better. That's not the rag on part one. It's just saying that when you have one of the literal masters of this kind of thing, you're going to notice a difference. And this does, of course, explain the more fluid action scenes under his direction. A more grounded setting also makes sense, as Part 2 is much more compact, it's much more directed, it feels like it knows what it is, and is much more in touch with itself than Part 1. A grounded setting helps add to this and does make sense. The part I don't understand, though, is why the character designs themselves changed. Shogo looks like anime MacGyver, Yui becomes generic brunette 23, and BD now rocks the Polnareff haircut. I don't mind any of this, it's just that this doesn't make sense to me. Perhaps they thought that a more grounded setting necessitated more grounded character designs, but again, you have designs like this, and like this, and the whole idea of a literal gang called Trash, so it's not like 100% grounded atmosphere is what they were going for. I have no problems with this redesigns, I'm just saying that they obviously stick out to anyone watching both movies back to back, although they don't prevent the two movies from fusing together very well, and part two is an excellent payoff to the sometimes clunky but well-intentioned part one. Another excellent aspect of both productions is the original soundtrack. Shiro Sagisu, who would later go on to compose for Evangelion and do other stuff, and his team created a real masterpiece here. The extensive OST covers genres from rock to pop to the divine and among the highest genre of all, city pop. I would recommend listening to the original soundtrack even if you have no desire to actually see the movie itself. It's that good, and stands above rank-and-file OSTs as an OST masterpiece. Just watch any scene from Part 2, or the city pop scenes from Part 1, and you will instantly understand how masterly crafted these pieces are, conveying such strong feelings for a fictional place with such passionate and layered melodies. On the topic of a fictional past, I would like to wrap up this little video by talking about the possible legacy of Megazone 23. Now, as in OVA, Megazone 23 isn't necessarily something that's always cited in, you know, the part of the Wikipedia article that people say inspired other productions. It's not easy 
to see what a cemented legacy Megazone 23 has, as again, as an OVA, you can't necessarily pin everything on it unless there were direct quotes from certain producers and whatnot. However, while the makers of The Matrix have denied this film has influenced them, having more likely been influenced by Ghost in the Shell, there were many scenes in Megazone 23 which made me wonder if this movie possibly inspired scenes in other productions. There's an underground city and biblically named computers like in Evangelion. There's a coup scene that is very similar to the one in Pat Labor 2. There's a commentary on AI, as seen in many other later cyberpunk anime. There's Lupin Cop! There's just so many things in this movie which, although that we can't prove inspired other things, I would like to say at least subconsciously inspired things. And it's a cool thought, knowing that this obscure piece could have helped build up some things which were not obscure and which would later on go on to prove to be groundbreaking pieces. That's not to say that this piece isn't groundbreaking. Again, these are some of the earliest OVAs, coming out in 85 and 86 respectively, serving as great trendsetters, proving that the OVAs could be something other than direct vhs garbage. They're true works of art, and they really are beautiful. Something I do know factually for sure, though, is that a few of these scenes from these movies have been used in some nice J-pop slash city pop compilations on YouTube. And having listened to many of these compilations, it was cool seeing those scenes in their natural habitat. There's the scene around the 58 minute mark of Eve talking in a beach-like setting, which I've seen in several footages, and there's the famous still of the Lucky Strike cigarette around the 12 minute mark, or 3 minute mark in part 2, I don't remember, which has been featured in several playlists too. It was a real moment of discovery seeing these scenes in their natural habitats. And while I did bag on part 1 a little bit for its OVA syndrome, I still think it's a passionate and enjoyable production, and I hold that part 2 is an excellent production both objectively and subjectively, surpassing part 1 in every way possible. They are both worth your time, and Megazone 23 is fascinating for just how many of the OVA boxes it ticks off, occasionally for the worst, but almost every time for the better. I think for this reason, Megazone 23 can be described as a quintessential OVA and an excellent obscure anime memory. <laughs>